the house that we lived in the longest. It looked like an old-fashioned farmhouse and what it would look like. Uh, wood had a wooden porch, colored brown, and you know, wood siding, wood shingle house, wood floors, uh, linoleum in the kitchen, uh, wall wallpapered pretty much. It was sat way back from the street. We had a front yard that probably was 50 feet deep. We lived on a street that was not paved. It was paved, but it was like an oil-based uh, uh, paving that they used to plow up every year and replace, sort of just like an oil, oil street. And, of course, they always plowed it just before it rained, uh, so it turned into a muddy mess. So we were just a little bit on the out, outside of the Compton city limits. And like I say, we were kind of in the country in that there were all of our neighbors had goats and chickens and rabbits and that sort of stuff. We were about a mile from a school that I went to elementary school in. I used to um, walk down an alley, dirt alley, going from uh, the street I lived on, turning toward Los Angeles. And I could look down that alley on a clear day, and we had a lot of clear days in those days. Uh, I could see the Los Angeles City Hall. And uh, it was maybe seven or eight blocks down that alley. Uh, I used to, uh, for a while, come home for lunch, and I would uh, run home eat my lunch, and run back in a half an hour uh, to be the first in line to tag up for a baseball workup game. I walked down that alley many, many times. When we moved to that house, I went to Francis Willard Elementary School, third, fourth grades, and then I went to a different elementary school, uh, five and six. I was a very shy kid. I was rather shy and quiet, and uh, the only thing that I excelled at in school was uh, athletics. Not that I was a great athlete, but I I was very fast. When I was in elementary school, nobody ran faster than I did. When I got into junior high school, which in in our uh, school district was the uh, seventh and eighth and ninth and tenth grades. I never made the track team because there were always one or two guys a little faster than me, but I was very quick on my feet, and I always excelled at at sports. But other than that, I learned from listening. I always did fairly good in school. I'd go into class and borrow a piece of paper from the girl in front of me and a pencil from the guy behind me, and and I'd do the work in class, and whatever I didn't do in class usually didn't get done, which is kind of bad. I actually left school after the um, after my second year of high school, and uh, during the war, and as the war was winding down, I was wondering, now what am I going to do uh, after the war? Um, I don't want to work in a machine shop. That's that's out, and because of the depression and because I hated that job so much, I had a real fear of getting locked into a job that I had to stay with, that I didn't like. I tried to join the Navy on October 27, 1942, on my 17th birthday, which uh, also happened to fall on uh, Navy Day. Uh, I was uh, rejected because of a bad ear, so I didn't get to join the Navy. So I went to work in a machine shop and uh, hated every minute of it. If you've never worked in a machine shop, you don't know what I'm talking about, but there was a big clock on the wall that never moved, and I didn't like to get up and go to work in the morning. I really didn't like that job. Ran a drill press or a grinding machine. I just ran different machines, and mainly drill press. Oh, it was just tedious and uh, boring. I mean, it was just a boring job. And uh, so what I did then was I went, uh, I couldn't join the Maritime Service, uh, which a friend of mine did. 
Uh, so I went to San Francisco uh, to the Siemens Union, and eventually I got seaman papers and, and went to sea as a merchant seaman. I got on a Liberty ship in San Francisco and went to Hawaii and then back to San Pedro. And it was a Liberty tanker, and at that point they turned it over to the Navy, so I had to get on another ship. I got on a Liberty ship, a freighter, and uh, went to, uh, uh, well, actually I went around the world. Went to Hobart, Tasmania, Colombo, Ceylon, uh, which in Colombo, Ceylon in those days, uh, up to Calcutta, and then back to Ceylon, and then to Durban, South Africa, and then to Rio de Janeiro, and then on up to New York City. It took about eight months. And uh, then I took a train back to, uh, to Los Angeles. That was a three and a half day trip on the train. Eventually I uh, got on another ship on a coastwise tanker that sailed from uh, Los Angeles to San Francisco, Seattle, and Portland, and back and forth. Uh, on the first ship I was on, I, I was a galley man. In other words, I cleaned pots and pans and peeled potatoes. Uh, so when I got onto this other tanker, uh, on this tanker, on the coastwise tanker, a friend of mine was on that ship and got me into the the engine room where I worked as a wiper and then a fireman, water tender, and eventually a pump man, second pump man. After I got off of that ship, I got on another tanker that went to Melbourne, Australia, Colombo, Ceylon, Calcutta, India. Spent about a month in Calcutta, India because of uh, repairs on the ship. And we went up to the Persian Gulf and then back to Sydney, Australia, where we spent another three weeks getting repairs, just mechanical repairs, not, not from any uh, war activity. Uh, then we went from Sydney to uh, Panama through the canal and took on another load of fuel and went to uh, Guam and Saipan and then back to San Pedro. Uh, at that point, the war was coming pretty close to being over in Europe. Uh, I was on that ship when Franklin Roosevelt died, and I think when I got off the ship, I don't know whether it was before or after uh, VE Day, a victory in Europe, but it was around that time. Uh, I didn't ship out again because I was not subject to the draft, and I knew the war was coming to an end. I didn't have much political uh, awareness at that time. However, uh, on the first Liberty ship that I spent eight months on, uh, I was in, shared a cabin with a, uh, a cook, a black, uh, black man by the name of Luchel McDaniels, who was a, a great guy and a lot of fun. Uh, but he was a, he claimed to be a uh, card-carrying communist. So I got uh, a lot of talk from him about communism, which I argued with him very vociferously, but uh, maybe not very effectively. Uh, but uh, that was an interesting experience because he was really a, a gung-ho communist. <laughs> On board ship, there was a lot of experiences that uh, that I was surprised at. It really got to be rather routine. The sunsets and the sunrises were beautiful. Uh, the weather usually was very nice, uh, but once in a while the storm would be terrific. Uh, I, I remember uh, one morning waking up because uh, uh, the porthole next to my bed was open, and the water came pouring in and practically knocked me out of bed. We never experienced any wartime activity to uh, speak of. We traveled in convoys from um, Ceylon up to Calcutta, 
and uh, we traveled in a convoy from Rio de Janeiro up to New York. Uh, Liberty ships were rather slow. They only went about 10 to 12 knots. It took us uh, 30 days to get from uh, San Pedro to uh, Hobart, Tasmania. Uh, I was in the engine room on the Liberty, I mean, on the uh, tankers. When we were working, we were down in the in the engine room and didn't get involved in any of the bad weather or, or any of the work that the deck people had to do when the weather was bad. So it really got to be rather routine. Uh, on the uh, tanker that I was on, the Mission Dolores, uh, the third engineer, I was... I was on the 12 to 4 watch. We were 4 on and 8 off, and I worked the 12 to 4 watch. And the engineer, Dave Shaw, uh, was a young man of about maybe 25. I was about 20. He went on to be a radio announcer on KFI in Los Angeles for a number of years. He was very, very good shipmate. We had a lot of fun when we were on watch from midnight to four in the morning. We didn't have anything to do but watch a few gauges, so we had a lot of fun uh, trying to name all the states, trying to name all the capitals and that sort of thing. We played a lot of mind games. It was pleasant, and of course going ashore in Australia was a, a real experience for a 19-year-old kid. India was a a shock. Uh, the poverty in India was uh, astounding. Uh, I was there in January of uh, 1944, and uh, it was just at the tail end of a, a famine. The uh, American army was picking up a couple thousand bodies a day uh, off of the streets. The people were starving to death, and their children begging on every street corner, and uh, I, I saw what real poverty was like. Living through the Depression was nothing. I didn't see people starving. I didn't see people hungry. I didn't see people begging on the streets. I mean, uh, the contrast was absolute. So India was a, 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 an awakening. Uh, South Africa was a beautiful place, but... Uh, uh, I knew that they were headed for problems. Uh, let me get back and tell you the story about uh, Luchelle McDaniel that I mentioned, the black person, the cook on our ship. When we arrived in Durban, South Africa, uh, we were going ashore, and they some people met him, and they walked him over and put him in a paddy wagon and drove off. While we were there, we were there maybe close to a week, nobody knew what happened to Luchelle McDaniels. Then when we were ready to sail, just before we were ready to sail, the paddy wagon drove up and Luchelle McDaniels came aboard, and I happened to be right there, and of course I had shared a cabin with him, so I said, Mac, what the heck happened? He said, well, he said, I was here almost a year ago, and they met me when I got off the ship, and they told me I could go any place I wanted, uh, any restaurant, any theater, any place I wanted, but do not take any of the natives with me. So Lou Michelle McDaniel said I rounded up two or three of the blackest, biggest guys I could find and walked into the best restaurant in town and demanded a meal. They rounded him up and put him in jail, that's the reason they picked him up and put him in jail on his return. 